Hi everybody, welcome to Zeal Zaddy. I'm Scott, my pronouns are he, him, and this is Story Talk, where every picture tells a story. Tonight we're do gonna do some world building, and we're gonna discuss geography and culture, its effects, how and how culture can even affect geography in inverse. Uh, and we're gonna do a little bit of fun world building exercises later on in the show. According to National Geographic, geography is the study of places and the relationship between people and their environments. It's an examination of how culture interacts with the natural environment and the way the locations and places can have an impact on people. So let's talk about how geography of, of the natural world affects the development of culture and society. If you have questions, just drop them in, in chat. I would love it if you put the word question before it, just so it's easy for me to spot. Um, during the intermission, I will show off Kickstarters that are either getting ready to start, where you can sign up to get notified, or are already running. Some of them, I think two of them, are within the last like 24 hours or 30 hours. So uh, if you find anything very really interesting, you know, hop over, check it out, back, you know, back something cool if you have if you have the wherewithal, but don't forget to come back. So I'm hoping you you don't leave the browser window. All right, let's bring everybody on because they were a lot more interesting and fun anyway. All right, so we have all of our guests tonight. I'm going to let them all run through their who they are, where they can be found, and say what you know what you're about. Why don't we start with with B and we'll go clockwise around from there. Hello, uh, I am Big B, Brandon, he, him. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, on Spout, on DriveThruRPG. Um, I'm creator of Yulfe, a urban fantasy role-playing heavy TTRPG. Uh, recently just had its first adventure, Dreamweaver's Debate, come out. It is free. Check that out on DriveThruRPG. Uh, but that's pretty much me. All right. KO. Hello, I'm K.O. Myers, also he, him. Uh, I'm a freelance podcast producer, editor at Particulate Media. That's at particulatemedia.com. Um, the easiest place to find me probably is still in the flickering, dying embers of Twitter at Troublematic. Um, I am also the technically still host of a, a TBTGRPG podcast called Roll Factory, which I'm in the process of rebranding. Um, so there will be announcements about that as I get that uh, nailed down. All right, and Danny. Hi, I am Danny. Uh, you can find me on the internet as at DannyNet20 pretty much everywhere. Um, I use he, him pronouns. I, um, you can hire me to run your games. Nice. <laughs> you know, I have an episode coming up in a few months on becoming a pro DM. Mm -hmm. the, the heroic efforts the heartache, <laughs> all the good and bad of what it means to become a pro DM. And I've well, heard all both, those stories. I've heard all the good and the bad, I think. Maybe not all of it. I've heard some good and bad. I'll have to talk to you about that one coming up. I yeah. think that's in, uh, I think it's in August, if I remember correctly. Right. But yeah. I don't know if my memory is good enough to know for sure that it's August. Um, so uh, why don't we get started with some questions? I, If you have questions, just a reminder, please drop them in chat. I have some questions to get get us started, and if you come up with something that you really want to know about, please, these are the, the right people to be asking questions of. <clears throat> so actually, K.O. had asked me earlier about um, philosophy of culture. Why don't you start us with your first question? You ask us a question about philosophy of culture and you know what philosophy you build off of. So you... I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm curious for all three of you, what is your sort of philosophical approach to world building? Do you start from a geographic lens and, and how that influences the society? Do you, do you start from a cultural perspective and like what, cause I, I think the two things are definitely intertwined, but yep. where you start in the thought process, I think maybe affects the outcome. So I'm curious where you start with. Yeah, I, I definitely, I think I usually, start i guess it's culturally technically um just because if i'm building like say a country or something um i the first thing i think of is like okay so what is the capital you know like what mm. is the um focal point like where the most people are you know if mm -hmm. um and then 
that can all because that building from there you can really pick all and choose all the other different like groups of people throughout the country because they would all all that you know a capital is usually more of like a melting pot kind of area um mm -hmm. for a country right um not always but yeah you would uh, hope so but, <laughs> but yeah um so it's you can find the interesting while you're making that you can find the interesting groups of people and things and personalities and then split them off into different parts of the world um and how long does it take you to think about from there like what the form of government is oh well you know it usually honestly has a I have, my mind goes okay how oppressive is the government and then it goes from there <laughs> oh, yeah. so you start with the most negative thing you can think of with the government <laughs> yeah yeah. Well, if you're looking for, I mean, if you're looking for drama, and you know, an evil empire totally. is about the pinnacle, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, and then that determines, yeah, how the body, how honestly, how a lot of the uh, <laughs> those things work. But um, yeah, and if the government is even present at all, you know, uh, we could just sure. be. <laughs> what about you, Brandon? Do you usually start with geography or uh, more cultural? <clears throat> I'm going to kind of cheat. And uh, <laughs> for me, it's both at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, because when I world build, one thing I love to focus on is folklore mm -hmm. and the stories that get passed down and that make uh, the citizens of whatever country, town, city, state, whatever I'm building uh, operate. So if I'm thinking of like, okay, I want these people to be uh, coastal, I want to first ask the question, what stories have they made from this? Like, mm -hmm. are they sailor stories? Are they stories about uh, maybe a far off sea cavern, like on the coastal shore and more of a rocky terrain? Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of use both at the same time to build each other up and kind of work my way out from there. Fun. Okay. Nice. Does that does that usually extend to the to the like creation myths as well, or is that is it is that a broader lens than maybe you're going for at that point? When it comes to my creation myths, I I don't go for more of the like large expanding pantheons and gods and deities of many different. Mm -hmm. uh, angles and whatnot. I usually go for more of a, uh, how, how would I put this? Uh, definitely a people focused kind of beginning. Mm -hmm. If they were to say the beginning, it would be like the first tribe that settled on this land. The beginning would be the first, uh, people that made something of the land. Mm -hmm. um typically i don't go too heavily into gods um just for simplicity's sake personally um <laughs> but yeah and i think i think maybe the question scott the question has sort of morphed as we've gone around i'm realizing that i've, I've sort of shifted from philosophy to sort of what your starting point is so i'm gonna throw yeah. that to you yeah and with me it's funny i think we all have three completely different spots i actually <laughs> start with maps because i'm mm -hmm. i make maps and I love mapping and maps. So I build a geography and then I imagine what would fit in different places. Mm -hmm. So then I build from there, I go um, ground up or top down, depending on what I'm thinking about at the time. Like it could be gods. If it's going to be a, a high fantasy game, they may have had some effect on, on even geography. Uh, or I build it like, where would the ports be or where would the trade centers be and build out mm. like, cause I think sp things spider out from, from trade centers for the most part, you know, places where there's active, heavy, um, population, you know, big populations tend to be, uh, the places where most interactions are going to occur, including for players. And I mm. do it from the philosophy of I'm building this to be a runnable world. So, I will think about things like agriculture, but I I don't think I've ever put the amount of time towards the agriculture that that I did on things like um, 
what are the major trade trade goods going through the ports, you know, that right. kind of stuff. So I've always thought I go big population centers out, I guess. But I always start with maps first. World maps, region maps, city maps, and then, you know, battle maps, if I'm gonna use a battle map for you know, lack of a of a better term. I think there's better terms for that, but and what about I think you, Kale? Well, I was I, to, to your point about agriculture. I think a good DM can find drama in just about anything, but raising wheat is a tough place to start. <laughs> it's a for, tough for person. building a <laughs> building a story. Um, so you know, I, yeah, my starting place is almost always sort of a hybrid. I don't have a I don't have a whole map necessarily, but I'll have a couple of locations that I. There's usually a city of some sort. There's very often very often there's a port. Um, there's usually some mountain, there's usually a forest and, and, and a handful of names. And then I'll sort of have like, it in my head, I guess it's a very fog of not war necessarily, but I'll have these locations and then the world around them. I tend to fill in as we play or as even in character creation, I'll have uh, characters when they develop their backgrounds. I'm going, okay, tell me what your hometown is and what is the, what is the world like in that part of the continent? Or what is, what is, what is, life like in that part of the continent what are, what are your export imports and exports what do you you know what are people how do people make a living that kind of thing and I'll so I'll fill it in slowly from there and then again as we as we visit new locations and so um, I'll usually have a sense of what how the world differs from you know the real world assuming we're not all yeah. living in a simulation um, and then That's I'll a big have assumption it, <laughs> We have to we have to live as if we're not because at this point we can't hack our way out. So yeah, um, <laughs> working on it. <laughs> so yeah, I'll ha I'll have like a, 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 the the you know magic is usually a big one, obviously in RPGs and um, and the setting of you know usually something sort of roughly Middle Ages is again that's a bit that's a difference. But um, and then I'll have a mm, not a slightly more micro locations that I'm working from and then the rest of it we fill in as we go. It's funny you you mentioned that and I had done a, a YouTube video about a year ago on countering my own philosophy of world building which was sometimes you can world build from the tavern out and, mm -hmm. and you know start small and really your goal as a GM or DM is just to stay ahead of the rest of the part of the party that you're running <laughs> with your world build. You could actually just build everything from nothing, mm -hmm. right? You know, ten feet in front of them. You know, as you go, mm -hmm. you know, a mile yeah. out from wherever they're traveling. If you're, if you have kind of an understanding of world building, you can, you can pull it off. And right. I thought that was a fun video to do. And I tried it because that's what I do for one shots. I'm not inventing a world for one shots, mm. and I don't necessarily love running. Uh, I love running homebrew, so I'd rather work with homebrew. So sometimes I'll just do that. I'll I'll plan out something very small, knowing as long as I stay ahead of them or outside their their boundaries of perception, I'm good to go. Well, if you do enough of those one shots and you collect all of those things <laughs> you that you can. build, eventually you've got an entire world. Yeah, <laughs> okay. working on that. that <laughs> yeah. All right, so I, I'm going to go to another question. I, that was an awesome start, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Funny. Uh, Thank you so, for allowing me to uh, to take no, over as the it. host for a few minutes. <laughs> so in your worlds, what do you do with people, not necessarily humans nor Earth, when you force them from their favored geography, from where they, uh, where they evolved, mm. assuming you use evolution, or where they were placed by the gods, if it was that? Hmm. Uh. I have a, a, like a world where it is basically our, it was our human earth, but in order to solve global warming, they crashed the Feywild into it. Um, and so there's just oh. Fey that live now on <laughs> earth, um, which is fun, but, um, Carnival Row. <laughs> yeah. So it's, I mean, and then usually I play the campaign, a campaign from there, like 300 years after that happened, you know, so now it's they're they've merged together into some like a culture of some kind. Uh, but it's always, it's an interesting thing. Cause I feel like if, um, depending on where they come from, there's always going to be some clash, right? Like, uh, which is always a fun, uh, just in a, in personality, you know, um, 
Like one game I run is like in like a huge like New York style city and there's just like a tree that grows out of the street one day, you know, and situations like that because the Fae are around and they're like, no, 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 this is where our neighborhood <laughs> is now. Um, and uh, just by their nature alone, they're not, they don't understand. They're not going to like, no, I, I don't need to pay for a building. Like <laughs> your, your paper is a paper. <laughs> Gentrification. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm here all night. Yeah, I'll write that one down. Oh my god. Uh, <laughs> but uh yeah, usually it's a um I th I will think of what the biggest conflict could be. Like what what seems because also, you know, yeah, as we said earlier, we're, you're writing for a game, right? So it's like, okay, where's my story hook? Where's my plot hook? <laughs> um and one idea one way to do that is to find what the um how why the people are upset right why are the people mm. upset um and a a good <laughs> i feel like an easy a good starting point is oh somebody showed up who we are in argument with um and yeah from build from there just um <laughs> figuring out i guess what's interesting to think about the phase situation already is that there is they they like have a very distinct like personality and world and everything uh, that's like you know pretty com common-ish knowledge it's you can tweak it however you want but um and then try to compare that now, then you get to make a culture a counterculture for that that they're uh, even if it is like our earth or anything else um so like yeah somebody these stuffy people are having a problem or the um yeah yeah or like um because i don't i usually am not don't lean towards the like now that they're i wouldn't put like sea elves be like now you have to live on the land is usually like on shore you know usually because that seems like um uh, if there's not if it's like if they can't go back to that if you know if their mission is to go back to where they want um it's usually not as complex as how do we live together now you know uh if, if they're i i always like to if there's no way back i think it's more interesting um usually than than that uh, I've, I've wandered now but <laughs> yeah, if there's a way back it's a war yeah right <laughs> yeah. so either yeah. it's a war or there's no way back yeah <laughs> but um yeah i kind of answered that it's um <laughs> i i want i i wandered around <laughs> lots of stories do but, well i i think danny i think you touch on a good point though that it's it makes a difference why why they were ejected or not able to live in their home environment in the first place. If it was a natural disaster, that is a different vibe than their homeland was seized. You know, it's climate migrants versus Trail of Tears are two very different dynamics. The the end result may be similar for the folks who are displaced, but um, yeah, there's a, I think that there's a different vibe. And and maybe a different potential outcome in terms of yeah, can we go back because there's a war, or we can't go back because to She's your point about lava. sea elves, like <laughs> yeah, or 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 climate, you know, climate change has driven uh, desalination or overheating of the ocean so far, and now we we can't it's deoxygenated and we have to go live on land because we can't use our gills anymore, right? Mm -hmm. I yeah. I I love this question in particular because this is a uh, major kind of uh, <clears throat> driving point when it comes to Yulfe, mm -hmm. uh and my game. Because um, in the game, there exists basically like three dimensions. There exists the shared world, which is our world. There exists the paracosm, which is the Fey Wild, essentially. And there exists the parasudba, which is the world of the abstracts, the Lovecraftian nightmares, the mm. realm that you do not want to go to. And what happens is that due to either a blip in reality or just curiosity, uh, creatures from the paras come to the shared world and investigate, <laughs> uh, basically wander look around, explore. But in my world, when 
the Parasudba and the Paracosm need each other. Uh, reality basically just goes, ah, no, no, I, mm, mm, <laughs> and just shoves them together because it cannot physically comprehend these two odd beings in a place that they're not supposed to be. Mm. And they, in turn, make the Yule Fae. Um, a combination of the abstract and the fairies. Hmm. So when it comes to the traveling of someone because of uh, displacement or because of their own curiosity and their own desire, uh, there's in at least the world of Yulfe, there's the consequence of changing who you are as an entity, as a uh, as a certain perspective that you had going into it before and you become something different, something new and I think that's pretty I, I think that's pretty indicative of like a, an immigrant's experience of going into a new culture and then you are something before that and then after you've been in this new land for a certain amount of time, you just become something different, something that you almost don't recognize for some people. Mm -hmm. uh, if they get assimilated into the culture, if they are willing to put themselves into it more. Um, so there's that question of what happens or like, what's the result of you uh, being in this new spot for a an extended period of time, it can change you. It can it can be a an altering experience that is more than just uh, minor altercations or run-ins. It can change you to your core, which mm -hmm. is what I like to get into too. Do you do you mind if I ask a follow up question here, Scott? Um, Not at all. It's Brandon. Mounting. I'm curious if you um, do. You, how do you navigate the tension between those characters wanting to preserve or memorialize the places and cultures and influences that they came from versus wanting to either either fit in or choose not to fit in in any place that they've found themselves? Well, for the fairies in particular, uh, they come from a land that is very in the moment. I, mm. a lot of their culture is just, you know, is this entertaining me right now? No, I'm going to do something <laughs> else. Uh, so it's TikTok. Yeah. Oh, very much. Uh, very much short attention span. Do what's fun in the moment. Do what's exciting. Um, and they don't really have perspective on anything other than the latest trend that's happening right in front of them. Mm. So when they come to the shared world, it's less memorializing their culture that they've come from. And it's more trying to bring the culture in the sense of their attitude and their dispositions and uh, the way they want to have fun. That's how they try to bring a little bit of home with them. Mm -hmm. um, the abstract, on the other hand, aren't really much of the home type. Uh, they don't, they're more of like a hive mind mm -hmm. and bits of them come off and form their own personalities uh, formed by their environmental pressures. So an abstract might come into the world and land by a pizza shop and they might take on the visage of one of the uh, shop uh, proprietors or one of the chefs. Another one might land by a volcano and might take on more of a visage of a uh, natural earth construct. Wow. They are adapting. Their culture is whatever they ran into at the time. Interesting. Nice. That's cool. 
So what about um, magic and geography? Have you ever built or created beings outside of gods that was able that were powerful enough to alter in in scale, big scale geography? And how did that affect people or cultures around them? I mean, we're talking about fantasy games a lot of times, and in fantasy, there's great magic. Even in in Tolkien, there was great magic in the old days, right? And they were able mm. to literally alter alter geography and climate and things to to whatever end it was they were choosing. Even up mm-hmm. into the later times, when you know the the great the one great power left on the earth on the on Middle Earth was altering the land around to protect itself. Um, hmm. So what about, do you, have you created or have you ever imagined great worlds? I know in Monty Cook's um, Numenera, there's this mountain range and right in the middle, there's a slice that looks like it was run over by a steamroller. And there's an interesting story in it about creating that. But, hmm. you know, that's more sci fantasy, science fantasy. But, you know, what about your worlds? Have you done have you have you pushed the boundaries of magic in mat in like in mass effect like that mm. controllable by non gods yeah so in the the world that i'm i'm in the process of doing of creating my first like really fully fleshed out 5e setting um and there is a a geographic feature that i'm <coughs> sort of i'm sort of deliberately leaving mysterious that it looks as though it was caused by some sort of cataclysmic event many, many millennia in the past. Um, and whether or not that, whether or not it was a natural disaster or if it was an accident of magic or long lost science is deliberately vague because I, because again, I'm, when I'm bringing, when I bring the characters into the world and the players into the world, I want to see where their mind goes when they see it. It's, it's basically, it's basically like, you know, Something that resembles the Yucatan Peninsula, Peninsula, where the where the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs, where they think it hit. So there's a you know a circular feature that looks like it was a very very large, the remnants of a very very large crater, and I'm I want to see where I have in the back of my head a couple of different ways that that could have happened, and I and I'm curious to see where the players, what they think when they learn about it, and then follow their thread through that. I think in I think I want it to be some misuse of magic but if they go down the natural disaster path then maybe that's where i'll follow them Mm. that's very fun i i like um yeah it's i feel like every world i make there's at some point there's some part of the world that's like ruined by something you know like a big a big cut in the world a lot i feel like a lot of times I do lean more into it being a god doing something obscene. Um, but uh, but I love, yeah, I love just this spot. It's always, always feels like if it's a grand act of magic, usually it's like this is a, this place is a ruined. This place is yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> wrecked. The maelstrom in the ocean. Uh... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I have one that's kind of the opposite that I really love. It's called, it's a, like in one of my worlds, there's a group of islands that's called the Defiant Isles. And it's um they're like very close to the southern pole of the world um but at one point like a bunch of druids were exiled out of the nearest country to there and they the place the closest place they could go was the defiant isles um but they wanted it to be nice and pretty and so they um used like they spent many years um basically hollowing the land and making it this um druidic like paradise and the wow. So the land around it for like 10 miles outside of each island is tropical. Uh, and so ah. there's just these like big spots on near the South Pole that are just these like beautiful tropical, <laughs> basically domes around these <laughs> islands. Um, That's fun. Like, like atmosphere fun. domes, like not physical, just like an yeah, atmosphere yeah, of just magical. Atmosphere, and, yeah. <laughs> so it's just they made, they spent years and years making the ground and the earth around there so heavy with druidic magic that it's just this beautiful that's, lush place that's, that's very biblical that's like you know the, <laughs> the garden of eden kind of thing yeah 
Yeah, very much as then though. So now they um they've gone to the point now where they have like missionaries who will go off from the Defiant Isles to the mainland. You'll find like a group of people being like, "You can live off the land. You don't have to do this. You know, you can like, <laughs> the world can be beautiful again." Uh, that kind of stuff, which is very fun. Um, <laughs> yeah, I will say deities are convenient scapegoats for stuff like that, especially they in are. the if your deities are the the 5e pantheon strikes me as being a lot more like the greek or roman gods where they're they have sort of petty personalities a lot of the times and reflect yes. human foibles and so it's it's not that hard to see them just in a fit of peak you know steamrolling half a mountain range or something yeah. like that uh, <laughs> so yeah they, they, they're they're easy to pin that sort of thing on uh to go back to what Danny was talking about with the Defiant Isles, uh, just a curiosity on, on my part, um, because going back to the, uh, the previous question too, hypothetically speaking, if like a, a boat of like 50 people went to the Defiant Isles in order to find refuge there, what would be their reception? Would that be something that would be like, Oh, you're welcome here, or would there be like certain hoops they would have to jump through? Yeah, there there are some hoops because they're definitely like when they, especially when they bring out missionaries, it's definitely like, yes, you're well, anyone is welcome, um, but you also have to do these things, <laughs> um, like because it's very much like um, part of the daily life of a person who lives there is to um, do this. Par- part of this ritual um, to continue to make the land fertile and nice. Uh, They have to continue doing this magic or else it will fade eventually. Mm. Uh, So they, I mean, they're, they're secret, you know, because they're, they're not all good. So their secret uh, (laughs) mission is that they want, the reason they send the missionaries out to get people is so they have more people and they can make their Mm. place nicer and bigger and things like that. Uh, But, um, so there is a little bit of like, yes, yes, come do your thing, but we are druids. So you're going to live kind of a more druidic lifestyle and you're going to have to do these things. Um, we'll teach you magic, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, come on, let's do it. Um, but yeah, it's definitely like, uh, and so then people who want to live that, that kind of lifestyle, but don't want to do the druid, druidic things are usually people who are more traders who would trade between the islands um because then they don't if they don't ever like live in actually on the island or like in a town on the island really um or village likes uh, then they don't have to really do, do the rituals but um but uh yeah definitely that place at least they're like hey pull your weight these are our, these are your taxes you know <laughs> <laughs> So I, you said something about them teaching other folks the magic. Um, your so did you make a conscious decision to have druidic magic be something that could be taught, or did, did that, are they are they looking to identify people with innate skill that they can foster? I make I made it something that can be taught. Um, it's like I imagine in a lot of my settings, um, I, I always imagine that magic is like an innate thing that most people have some spark of it within them they just don't know how to reach it Mm. um and so like a lot of magic teachings are how to access that power um and that's why there's different like you know if they're doing dd there's different classes and things so that's they they, they're able to reach that power in a different way Mm -hmm. um so like druidic magic would be you know you're you're connecting your you know let's say chakra or something um to to the earth around you to the world around you tap into that natural system and gain um, and some people don't figure it out, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> but, but they still do the rituals. Um, they still are supposed to do the ritual every day. Maybe they're not actually putting anything in, but, um, they're but they do believers. Yes, essentially. <laughs> um, you'll figure it out someday. <clears throat> um, just keep trying. But, um, yeah, that's essentially the idea. <laughs> Cause I think magic, I mean, magic is in its, in and it is in of itself a resource, right? And controlling it is a source of power. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go off on a little bit of a tangent here, but um, there's a really fascinating uh, podcast episode that I listened to a, a while back that I went back to re- revisited for today. Um, it's the, the author N.K. Jemison who wrote the Broken Earth trilogy, um, 
the city we became and its sequel, whose this name has just flown out of my head, are her most recent books. But um, she she's on the Ezra Klein show. She basically did they did a live world building exercise that uh, reproduces these seminars that she runs, um, and the point that she made pretty forcefully, I thought, was that to understand, to, to really build a world, you have to understand how our world works. And that's not just on a physical level, that's on a social level. That's sociology, that's how people work and how, the, and how cultures are organized, which is very often not logical and is very often organized around power, holding on to power, wielding power over others. And so magic as a, I think, uh, in the Crin setting, the the towers of high sorcery and the sort of like trials you have to go to to become a, to become a mage, that is an example I think that that has a, a fairly well thought out philosophy of like here's what it would look like if you actually had this resource and somebody wanted to control it and uh, keep it from being sort of a common, just a common good. But there, I think that's a place where a lot of world building falters that they. <laughs> We just we, we we start with the classes and okay yeah they can they all get magic from a different source and we don't often step back far enough to and say well that's a really big like the the ability to manipulate reality like that is a huge power and of course if the people in this world are anything like the people in our world somebody would be trying to get a monopoly on it. There mm. there's a good book called um, Jonathan Strange and Mister Norrell that yes. really talks it, the whole book talks about that bringing magic into society mm -hmm. as part of a, a a cultural control mechanism and magics outside society are really evil and dangerous and should not be mm. explored and when they explore it they find that there's both similarities but powers that they never had gotten before through their studied magics that was a, they did a TV show of it once. I think you got one season on the BBC that was pretty good. I think you could probably find it, but the book is better, of course, because the book is always better. But, you know, the that's just how it goes. Although that may be the perspective of, of all of us because we write things. So, <laughs> you know. I I really liked the, the adaptation, actually. And I, th I think it only got one season because it basically covered the whole plot of the book. I think it was intended to be oh, I mean, it's just an adaptation of the book. Uh, but um, yes, uh, yeah, and um, but you're right. Yeah, and, and, and there's another one where like the, a fey incursion sort of throws the whole, the whole system topsy-turvy. So yeah. it relates, I think, to Brandon's world building, especially. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking um in my world the geography is the same as you know our normal uh everyday world here uh the one difference is that much like the uh denizens of the two separate dimensions there are bits and hunks and chunks of land uh and uh, terrain features that will sometimes just drop by. And uh, much like uh, Matt was saying, uh, or uh, much like Danny was saying, sorry. Uh, God, brain after work. <laughs> uh, anyway. <laughs> um, You've just got a Matt face. I know a couple mats. <laughs> um, uh, bits of terrain will just come into our world, and you can be driving down, you know, the same old street you would in your city, and then all of a sudden, there's a jungle there. Just a full-on jungle. Wow. And it could last a minute, an hour, a year, a it century. In your world, and this actually is a good question for everybody, is in your world or in worlds you've done, is the geography and the biome like a Gaia kind of thing where it's living and it's a breathing entity? Or is it inert and it is affectable by 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 outside forces? Like the Gaia Earth theory, always, you know, the idea was 
earth is a living thing. You know, that the whole earth is a living thing and can feel and can affect and can change. But in a fantasy world, you can really take that, a, you know, a step further where it can attack you. It can, it can wall <laughs> off mountains between you and, and places it doesn't want you to go and what have you. Have you, have you hmm. explored doing things like that or have you done things like that? Not for the whole planet. I think there's there's usually, you know, like the the dark twisted magical forest is a is a is a fairly common trope, and I've yeah. that I've used. Um, True. Whether or not that's innate to the to the landscape, or if there are you know entities living there that create the hostile environment, um, but I think, yeah, I've used pieces of and and usually and very often there are either full-on deities or fey spirits associated with different environments as well so they can they can manipulate it but there's also i mean in in and in dungeons and dragons like dragons for example their their lairs are warped by their magic yeah. and the regions around them are warped by their magic and so the um it's a place it's a place where i think you can have both story and uh, mechanical influences because not sure. only are you from a story perspective like the, the very earth is reacting to the magic of this creature but then you also have hazards environmental hazards that they have to navigate as they're on their way if they you know if whether they're passing through or they're actually trying to find the dragon um so but yeah no i've never i've never explored it as far as like having the entire planet being or even a significant chunk of it being a single entity uh I've done a like a sci-fi kind of setting where everyone lives on basically the Borg, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, or like the replicators, uh, where like the the whole planet is a machine, which is fun because mm. then that's um, you know not it's not the same. It's not Gaia, right? But it is something that is moving and thinking and doing things. Um, or it is a central power or intelligence or something, and that's always. Um, I think that's e almost easier to do because it feels more um, more targeted, more specific, which because the the earth or land feels a little bit random, a little bit uncontrollable. But it's fun to have this th this thing where the planet, even if it's controlling itself, is controlled. You know, it's not um, <laughs> so it could directly be like, hey, no, no. <laughs> um, and that's always good. Um, but then, yeah, on the kind of opposite side of the spectrum, I do love a world that can move around. I also love a world that is like is completely dead, you know, like mm -hmm. a place where it seems wrong that it's not do that nothing's happening. A um, you know, like if you go to like I don't know, like a like a Shadowfell like situation or something where there you go to a petrified forest, you know, is always even it's sometimes more fun than a, a, a moving woods um, yeah. or a, um, or yeah, like a sci-fi setting, you're stuck on a moon. <laughs> you know, that's uh, <laughs> just a moon. Uh, all right. Now, how do we get adventure out of this? Like dark, you know, this dark, dusty, dry scape um, floating through space. But um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, in sci-fi, sci you can get away with some things you can't in fantasy, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. On me. Oh, definitely. I'm thinking of the Spelljammer setting. Don't, aren't there, like, cities that are built in the bodies of dead gods that are just floating yes, out in the astral the husks. sea? Yeah, the uh, husks yeah. of them. Uh, uh, but also, uh, there's the example in the MCU of the the head of the Celestial that is, they call it Nowhere, I think, Yeah. Um, that features in the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. Um there's a really fascinating, it's a little bit of a, of a tangent, but there's a, a book called Towing Jehovah by James Morrow. Um, it's actually the start of a trilogy, but the, the basic premise is that the Christian deity God dies and this mile and a half long body is floating in the ocean and they hire a, t they hire a, a tanker to tow it to the Antarctic so it won't rot. <laughs> and of course, there's this, you know, all the moral implications of well, God was real and now he's dead. And all of the people involved, of course, have, have, have all these, these terrible, tragic backstories and personal <laughs> foibles. And his books are very, very funny and very, very dark. But um, it was a formative, a formative text for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds awesome. I'll look that one up for sure. <laughs> I was 
something. Yeah, definitely. I have a spell jammer setting where they go to the city husks regularly, and there are a couple of them that are. I like made a. I changed a thing where in order to get like, cause I I modded out all the ships right from their things, and mm -hmm. I was like, oh yeah, booster engines use like husk skin as fuel. <laughs> so like, there's always <laughs> these people oh, like so mining, mining. The, ah. yeah, mining the husks <laughs> and things. Um, it's very fun. But um, and there's always quests to be like, oh, that you know, that's it's haunted or whatever. You know, the mine mm -hmm. inside of the god is a, is haunted. Is always a fun kind of. Uh, <laughs> This is a crossover question for, from your world building to your GMing or DMing. How descriptive do you get when you're describing places in your world? Do you talk about the geography and, and it, do you get into a lot of detail on it? Do you do that with the culture or do you really only talk about what's specifically in front of them? Like how, how much lore around culture and geography do you, do you drop on players? And are you really descriptive or is it very much just like there's a mountain range there? Uh, yeah, I would say that, like I said in the beginning, I like to combine the folklore of the people and the surrounding areas like mountain ranges, seas, caverns, such, a, uh, such things. And there is a strong connection between the uh the people and the land in a lot of these stories i tell um uh one of my 5e campaigns i ran or am currently running uh it's a it was a land that was completely autumn all the year long uh and there were jobs based on that. Like there were professional leaf removers and there were like sports based around, uh, you know, who can clear this patch of land of leaves the quickest. And like there were uh, even foods that were made around mulch. Uh, <laughs> just... like, There's gotta be a lot of mulch. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, the connection between the people in the land and the ways that they can intertwine in such a way uh, is just such a natural starting point for me. And I can't think of a way to start a world better than just figuring out that simple connection. That's a very human, like telling stories about our environment is a very human thing to do. And I think that that it w makes a world feel really lived in if the people that populate it, you know, even just, the, you know, NPCs and, and their cultures or whatever, they have their own stories about how the, how they came to be there, what their role has been in the, in shaping the world around them. Like that makes it feel very, to me, it makes it feel very genuine. Yeah. I agree. I think I think a, a I, I've seen both kinds of DMs. I've seen DMs that are very vague about things that are around them. I think that tends to lend itself towards someone who wants to run fast actiony games because they don't want to they don't want to spend the time in 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 their in descriptive rather than the what's going on quickly. Mm. And then I've mm. seen some that they really do take the time to make sure that there's a not only an understanding of what's going on around them, but a feel for it. And I think that's where all these descriptives come from is they help you create mood and a feel for a place. And given time and understanding of why it's the way it is, if you're going to be in a place long enough, you know, I think that's always nice to see when, like I happen to like more narrative kind of games anyway. I like players to create around things too. I'm totally cool letting characters, you know, players uh, write, you know, through through dialogue or, or description what's going on around them or what, you know, what the place is like. As long as it's not counter to what the world is or something that's, you know, way off for no reason, you know, but I think that's cool when you get a player that can do that too. 
Yeah, I'm definitely the same way where like I will I will try I like to be descriptive, but I'll try to keep like each location down to a paragraph, you know, something like here are a couple of interesting things about this area just so be, so that the players can ask for things like you know like i really want to go to a hot dog stand where are there <laughs> hot dog stands like yeah actually they're famous for hot their hot dogs here um <laughs> you know uh that because I, I think like if you over describe then the players feel like they're a bit in a box yeah uh, yeah be careful. and so you gotta balance yeah it. i like to think about like which genre too you're aiming for here because yeah. i like to run a lot of horror themed games mm. so like Mood's describing big. the environment is the bread and butter if you yeah. don't describe the environment it feels yeah. very dull and plain and yeah like there uh, that same thing that danny not matt uh was <laughs> saying before um is that because horror again um being put in that box in an adventure game is boring it's dull why oh great i get to go to an adventure that is you know point a to point b but on the other hand when you're put in a box and you're also asked or you're also put in the situation of you're in a box and you don't know if you want to go outside that box because you don't know what's right outside that door is another effective way that you can use a lack of or a overly descriptive environment to your benefit when running a game uh, to create that sense of, do I want to explore this? Mm. <laughs> so, but yeah, I think I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, Danny. No, no. Uh, I was I was gonna say that reminds me a lot of um if you're if anyone ever played Brindlewood Bay, um it's a lot of like there it's a it's a game um where by just Jason Cordova where basically you are a bunch of old ladies um solving murder mysteries, a la murder she wrote. Oh yeah. Um <laughs> and, I'm, I'm gonna um, run that soon. It's so fun. I love that game. Um yeah. But uh, a big part of the mechanic of the game is the players describe locations and pick things. But so what makes it creepy is then you say, oh, yeah, but there's this. Because you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. um, right. the conceit of the game on top of it is like, why are so many murders hap- happening in this one town? Because the murder <laughs> she wrote, like hundreds of people die in this town. Right. And no one asks why. And so there is like a, like a Cthulhu-esque like back hidden thing yeah. behind this game. Oh, uh, nice. And so there is that like, oh, yes. Yeah, you're walking through the forest. You know, you're pulling up berries in the forest. All of a sudden, all the trees have eyes. Now they don't. Okay, um, you know, <laughs> or whatever. Um, but it's just but your little old ladies, just like you know, make, getting blackberries for your pie, you know, or whatever. Um, H- horror and, can, uh, horror helps everyone change. Yes, and to yes, but. <laughs> exactly. Or no, exactly. thank you. <laughs> but. But to your point about genre, Brandon, I think there's a lot of, I think it matters to what the focus of the particular session is as well. I tend to think of my, I tend to think of descriptions in a, in a fairly cinematic way. So you're starting with an establishing shot that gives you like a sense of the, a sweeping sense of what landscape you're in, but it doesn't have a lot of detail. It's just broad strokes. You're in a, you're in a deep, dense forest. You're in a, you know, you're in a howling windstorm in the foothills of a, of a huge mountain range. And then you narrow down into the, you know, the camera narrows down into the, into the, into the immediate location. And then you give them more detail. So you've, you've established what is, what is, you know, in the bigger box, but then the corner of it that they're in, you get really specific about. And if they want to explore, you've established that, yeah, there's a little bit more of this around them, but it's, you know, it will be different. Obviously, you know, no location is exactly, no two locations are exactly the same. But to your point, Scott, like, yeah, if you, if you're, if you want to say, okay, I want this to be the setup for something then, okay, you're traversing the mountains and you, you just say, oh, it's, you know, it's a long grueling hike and you, you arrive the next day and you're, you know, muddy and drenched and, and, and it's terrible. Or you can go, if you want it to be sort of gritty survival mechanic kind of thing, you say, okay, 
roll me a survival check to see if the if you can find the, the trail and then roll a, a luck check to see if it's been washed out or um you know r- r- athletics checks to climb rocks without falling and all that stuff and so how detailed you get depends a, i think a lot on what you're trying to focus on that session yeah definitely um we've hit the midpoint we just got a question from rune birdie but i want it's a, it's a big enough one i want to save it for when we come back from from the um the intermission uh, everyone stick stick around during the intermission. You'll see new and upcoming Kickstarters or running Kickstarters. Uh, I'll drop links to all of them in chat. It becomes kind of a long link drop, but if there's anything you really find exciting or interesting, check it out. I hope you back some things and support all these indie creators that are really trying to make us remain in the golden age of, of TTRPGs, which I think we're in personally. Mm. You know, and I think the OGL debacle is making it more golden, not less. <laughs> so because there's more people making new settings and new, mm-hmm. you know, and new game systems, and there's a lot more people willing to try them. So uh, we'll see you in somewhere between five and ten minutes. I don't know exactly how long it'll be. Uh, so enjoy the Kickstarters. See you in a few. All right, and we're back, everybody. <clears throat> We got our drinks together, had a bio break, bio breaks. So we did get a question from Chad just before we went on break. So I do want to bring it up. So here's what, what, hold on, let me get the name. Rune Birdie, which is a very cool name, asks, as you say, but then there's this, how might you use or do you use that additive nature to incorporate player input into building a world? And do you do so in other ways? <clears throat> well, so like I said at the top, I will very often will um, will ask the players to give me a sense of what their the home their character's home region was. Whether that's you know if they're a one of the standard races, one of the standard fantasy races, if that's just a portion of the world, or if they're an extra planar, uh, you know, if they're a fae or whatever, then what they're what whatever their home world was like or home area was like. And I'll then incorporate that because, because unless their tragic backstory is they've been exiled and they can never go home again. Um, at some point we're probably going to things, whether it's rituals that they observe or holidays that they, that they observe or, you know, just other, or, you know, ways that they're where, where they grew up prepared them for life. We're going to revisit them, even if we don't physically go to the location. And so I like to build that into the world. But the other way that I do it, I was actually just thinking about this while I was out with my dogs, is um, I will I will actually sometimes build a sort of a, a world, an in-world reason for um, some of the safety tools that we use. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of lines and veils, mm-hmm. and one of the hard lines that I draw in all my games is sexual violence. I just don't include yeah. it. I don't let my mm-hmm. players bring it in either. And um, I have started, I haven't gone into a lot of detail about it, but I've basically said the deities in my realm have just decided that, you know, murdering babies is okay, but <laughs> sexual violence crosses the line. I've never gone into a lot of detail about why, but just that is a taboo that it, that comes down from the very top of of the you know pantheon hierarchy, whatever. And so it just it's pervasive in the world, hmm. and it's partly as a way to to center it in in the fiction, but also to kind of I've never I've thus far I've never had a player try to argue with me about that which is, I, I count as a blessing, but kind of cutting off the possibility of, well, why, why couldn't it, you know, why wouldn't it be a real, the argument, the argument that you always get is, you know, it's realistic for the time, right? It's also why there, you know, there are black which elves also because, bullshit, but, you know. <laughs> yes, which is, which is, which is all terrible. But, um, so cut, basically to cut that argument off at the pass of like, well, it's not realistic. Well, you know what? It is realistic because these deities have just decided that they don't want that as part of their world. So, yeah. um, respectable and very interesting. I actually have an episode on safety tools and how, and maybe talking about ways we can even improve them coming mm-hmm. down in a, in a, I think a month or so. I think it'd be very cool. interesting. Yeah. 
<clears throat> there, that reminds me actually of something that in screenwriting, like there was a time when I wanted to be a screenplay writer. So mm -hmm. I think all writers go through that at, once, at one point. <laughs> but what I found was at the, it was, there's been eras of writing styles within screenplays. And I mean, in controlling the camera via writing, right? Mm. In the old days, you would say, the writer would say, camera pans. That gone in the 80s. Mm -hmm. That was a 70s, 60s thing. When most of the screenplays were written with or by directors who were or producers who were going to make their, their movies. Mm -hmm. So they wrote it themselves. Mm -hmm. As it became more democratized into writers that became specific screenplay writers, what happened was you had to learn to write in ways that guided the director where you could become the puppet master of the director a little <laughs> bit, which would be, you would do things like write in, uh, the camera gets blown, or the, the candle gets blown out in the narrative as a control mm -hmm. for what the director should do. Now, director can, can still ignore it, but you put guidance in for them without telling them explicitly what to do. Or... Mm. The camera get you don't say the camera the candle becomes big on camera. You don't tell them to move a close up in. You do it in much more subtle writery ways. Well, in a way, what you're doing is you're using the gods as a tool to control the morals and the morality of players without it being explicit. Yeah, and I think that's very fascinating. Hmm. Yeah, I never really thought about it that way. Interesting. Because it, well, it's funny because I'm positioning it as trying to. Not, I'm almost, I'm positioning it as, yeah, yeah, that's, I guess I see your point. I'm, I'm trying to position it as not controlling the morals of the players. I'm just saying this is a thing that doesn't exist in this world and not giving them the choice. But, but it's, yeah, it is sort of. You're freeing them from having to think about doing the awful things that yes. the PC might occasionally think of doing and making sure they know that is no. If they've read too much George R.R. R. Martin, yeah, they might think, yeah, oh, well, exactly. that's, that's an acceptable tool. Um, yep. Yeah. Fascinating. Any, um, any other tools that, that you guys use to, to do this stuff? Any other ways that you give guidance or uh, actually, more importantly, let players create around you because that's really what the question was was how do you yeah. let players create around what you've what you've put in front of them and i think systems have a lot to do with that i think a lot of systems are built for that like i know invisible sun your character creation is building your environment around you you're creating your environment your home where you live in this alternate world as part of character creation i find that fascinating it it made me fall in love with the game which is why I'm going to run it in, I think, July. So, you know. Danny, um, I think, are you talking? Oh, no, uh -oh. you're not talking. Now you are. Still can't hear you. Yeah, it says you're not muted, but. Now you are muted. Now you're unmuted. Brandon, did you did you have a? Can you hear me now? Uh, there yes. we go. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you can go. I could. <laughs> um. Uh, to kind of <laughs> touch back on when we mentioned uh, Brandon Lee Mulligan earlier, um, one of the easiest ways to just get players incorporated is to not be afraid to yes and. Um, hmm. Even if it's not something that you had planned beforehand, even if it's not something you were thinking about, it really doesn't hurt to just allow your players to say, you know, if they were a part of a circus and they visited a town once before and they said, hey, I remember in this town we visited this one neat bar. Yeah. And when you went to that bar, you also found this out, like just even if it's not something that you're used to, just go with it because mm. the the biggest reminder to any world builder or 
uh, specifically more when it comes to a game master of a TTRPG, is that you and your group are telling the story. You and your group are making it together. So you're just kind of the guiding hand in it. You're making a base and you're adding the flavor along with your players. So just being open-minded and allowing your players to just kind of run with what they feel is the simplest and easiest way to implement a player heavy interactivity. Yeah. And I, I love, I, yeah, and it has to do a lot with the players too, right? Cause like, I'll run games for people who haven't like played very much and I really want them to do that. I really yeah. want them to incorporate things. They're like, please tell me exactly what ever, how many tables are in this bar, you know, um, situation that always, that depends. It really depends on what, how comfortable, if the players want two. to, do that, right. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, there's two. Yours and they're and both taken. Table. <laughs> Which one do you say? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's, there's, one table with one guy who has a quest for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, I, I also love to, um, I, in my day job, I do, I'm more, I'm not a writer, my day job, I do, but I do design things. I'm like designer. And so something I try to do and I try to apply it to storytelling as well as to never be precious about anything that I've created. Mm. Um, because, and that, anything can change. It can get thrown out the window at any second. Um, and so, cause like I've definitely spent like 40 hours on a project and then for them to be like, ah, cut it, <laughs> you know, on it. And then it's like, okay, I could either get upset or let it or roll with it, you know? And I think that has to do a lot with too, if you want your players to jump in and help you story tell is like, yeah, you might have, you should, ha you, ha you have a plan, right? You have what you want, but then they, their storytelling will completely change. You know, now the bar has um, only sells martinis and it's a cocktail <laughs> bar. Uh, and or you know, your creepy guy at the corner is now wearing a cocktail dress and is smiling at you from the corner with a wink. Um, you know, like that's the kind of, uh, I think that's, that's the way I love to try to get players to do things. It's like, yeah, yeah, you, what do you want? What are you interested in seeing in this place? I'll change it, we'll change it all. Let's, re let's redesign. In, on, for you. <laughs> one, one tool I've used that I think is, has been really interesting in that aspect with the, the game that I'm currently running, the D&D game, is I've had a lot of dream sequences and vision-like sequences where the players are involved in either something that has happened or that is a dream. And I usually use a seed for it rather than write out the whole thing. And I let them actually write and play and play through the dream knowing I know in my head there's some information that needs to get out I'm mm -hmm. not going to tell them what it is they will create all the environment around it because it's their dream but I have it, my job then is to make sure that what the dream is supposed to mean is is within is within mm -hmm. the dream but it's their sequence and I let them create their own from a seed that I set you know, and I think that's a really fun way to work with things where I, I'll write down uh, Caradwin's dream should be related to uh, the land of the witch's fingers, which is a, an area where her family used to live near. So I want them to find out something about this, but it will come through a dream sequence or a, a flashback, you know, go through a flashback the same way. And hmm. part of that comes from the idea that they've had enough time in the world that they know how the world um, is in a lot of places. And I mean, the, the, the campaign's been running two and a half years. So hmm. a lot of them know a lot about what the world is. And some of that is just, you know, I trust them as, as role players to bring really interesting stuff to the table without it being just off the wall in a way that is uh, meant to break the, the game. You know, I think mm -hmm. in one shots, I don't know if I'd risk that, you know, or I would just risk it all the way and they could break reality all they want, you know, cause it's one shots to me are all about <laughs> chaotic madness as fast as possible. <laughs> Longer campaigns, you really can't, 
you can't live off that for very long and have much of a meaningful story, I don't think. I think you need arcs and mm. stuff to help them feel like growth matters and all that. <laughs> yeah. Say, so, I love a good flashback as a storytelling mechanism. And um, I love thinking about like letting players control things. The flashback is perfect for that. And especially um, in um, from a, they do a really good in from afar podcast where they, um, they'll do flashbacks and the other char- other players will play characters from the flashback, like your uncle or, you know, or you're mm-hmm. like, instead of the, instead of the GM or the GM will play one person and then gives, cause it's, it's very fun as a um, story building. Now, now the flashback is a together thing, you know, it's mm-hmm. a, um, it was, the GM is still there to like, you know, as a character to be like, yeah, but you go this way, you know, or whatever, but it's like, um, is really it brings a lot more life to a flashback because I feel like a memory can be kind of be like a, you can really focus on like okay what is the what am I trying to remember here mm. <laughs> you know um, but it makes it feel more alive and things um, the more characters the more the players get to contribute to it especially things like that but mm-hmm. <laughs> all right you you want to do a little world building exercise I think yeah be fun. sure all right yeah so. It, one of the things that I've been playing with is in doing these world building ones is to give you scenarios <clears throat> and let everybody kind of imagine what would happen or change with with someone. So we had touched on one challenge that, that came earlier, which was displaced peoples. So I have a scenario. Let me let me see if I can bring up the map that I want. Yes. I'm being a good okay. player. I brought my pen and pad to take. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna talk about a Arakakra people. So they're flying and all that. Mm. But they've been displaced displaced from the mountains to the east by the giants that have have moved in and taken their their roosting grounds, the places where they lived high up, made it too dangerous. So they went to this deserty area with plains and fields running along the rivers a lot less protection but the giants don't want to go down there <clears throat> now imagine in in two there's two things that are going to happen let's talk about both of them one of them is how do they change culturally to adapt mm. and that can mean a lot it can mean philosophy it can mean a lot of things and then how would you change them if they had enough time to evolve to the to the land because that's a different thing, another different thing. Mm-hmm. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to, let me move all this stuff. This was, I was going to use like world building lists, but I don't think we need this with this group. So I'm going to write some of the ideas in chat. Please join in. Tell us some ideas you have. So we have an Arakakra, uh tribe that moves to a new place that is very different, potentially uncomfortable for them to live in, but it's the best they can do. I do want to applaud you for picking the one that was going to be the hardest to spell. Just oh. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it, couldn't, it couldn't have been a dwarf, right? It had to be. Uh, <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not even sure I got it right. I, um, I don't think I got it right. It was like five or six A's. You found it. Yeah, yeah. Just throw some, throw, throw some A's and a K and a C in there. Yeah, I know it it's two A's. This <laughs> Um, well, and so, so, so they were, dipl- they were displaced by another culture. I think is, w- were there any indigenous oh, humanoids living there when they there got were there? not, okay. we're going to so give them free, free reign over the, over the land here. Okay. Ooh, okay. So, so completely uninhabited land that and they come across. Most of the vegetation would be near these water sources. I assume the, the, Broader yes. plains are more are, are more arid, maybe yeah. savanna, maybe. Yeah, okay. it's kind of like the Nile, you know, desert around it, but along the rivers, there's right. you know fertile fertile uh, lands for growing and all that. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> were we? Do we imagine that when they lived in the mountains, they were? Did, were they practicing agriculture, or were they more of a hunting gathering? Because I think that would make a difference. That's a good yeah. question. Yeah, I, I would think, yeah, I think that probably makes the most sense because if you're up in the mountains, it's, hard to grow it's not in the like, mountains. yeah, hard to grow in the mountains. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And I'm I'm wondering if they would I, like I I'm not I'm trying to decide for myself if I thought they would go to agriculture or if they would go more to like fishing. Mm. Um, you know they've got these rivers and mm -hmm. and the sea uh, or, and the sea, or, not or a huge lake. I don't know which one it is. Yeah, but um, but there is a lot of you know while they live in the desert, there is a lot of water nearby. And you know if we're go if we're talking if they are more bird like, you know if they are leading into being birds, you know that does feel. Right, um, fish is a big dietary thing for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, right. Do they become so chickens thinking... or do they become seagulls? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, like, I imagine them hunting, like a uh, like a peregrine falcon. Like when they just nose dive down, <laughs> since they're so used to being high up, they mm -hmm. use that to their advantage. Mm -hmm. So, not having that advantage anymore. I would, I'm immediately like imagining like the warriors of the clan or the tribe and completely having to reevaluate their fighting style and how they approach, uh, how they approach these things. So, wow, I, I imagine them starting to like craft uh, if they're going to get into fishing, crafting spears, uh, having to use more things beyond their physical self uh, because they're going to need to be uh, inventive in this space that is not accommodating to them in the slightest. Mm. Uh, There's also an interesting potential. Uh, Scott, you mentioned about physical changes, but I think even... The, the physical attributes that are more desirable might shift pretty suddenly if you're talking so if, if, if their original habitat was mountainous you you know you know being high up and and, and switch which suggests eyes and, colder and all that suggests colder so yeah so uh, uh, you know subtypes that were that are better adapted to the heat but I'm also thinking about the the difference between fast diving flyers versus players who can fly, who can glide or go a long distance. Um, you know, if they, if fishing is, is, makes a lot of sense, but if the, as their population grows, they might outgrow the fish. And so they, if they have to start doing, um, more you know, hunting, hunting land species, they might have to be tracking over long distances. Um, mm. so that, that would, that would make people, you know, make, uh, individuals who can fly, who have endurance rather than s speed, um, and or who are more comfortable navigating on the ground. Um, so they would suddenly, where they where in the old environment, they might have been, their status might have been diminished because of that. Now suddenly they have this valuable skill or valuable attribute. Um, so there's a, there's a potential for you know, status levels to change because of the environment. Yeah, I actually think there's something very, very interesting there because I imagine when you're displaced, at least early, there's got to be a psychological effect on the importance of status. Mm. You, your leadership lost you your land. Does your leadership change because you don't have a, the same level of trust that you had in them before? Mm -hmm. um, another thing about temperature is like, do they lose or gain more feathers or like you know, heat is a, is a, is a beastly thing when you're used to cold. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know. I think that's very interesting. Yeah. That, the idea of that. It's talking about status made me think too. Like if they're or cocker used to being high up in the air, maybe a uh, at a place where you can't get like lumber very easily and things. Maybe being high up, like having your home or your building higher in the air, could be a much more of a like a a status symbol and things. Mm -hmm. So um, like, oh. can you gather the resources to get lumber to make your house up on stilts, you know, and things like yeah. that. Um, so it could be fun as in like by closer to the rivers, you know, there are these houses on stilts and things. Um, and the farther out you go farther into the more deserted areas are these lower, smaller huts, you know, as even it gets taller in the center and things. Um, because that would be a, a symbol of wealth. Mm -hmm. See, I could also see uh, going to kind of like a story aspect on it. I could also see a lot of Eric Cocker having kind of that counterculture reaction to it as like, uh, 
I, I would totally see others trying to build and trying to uh, replicate their old environment, but I could see plenty of others saying that like our old environment is what caused us to be arrogant or maybe mm -hmm. ignore these things that we were taking advantage on of these people that forced us out. So you're just repeating the same mistake that we've already had to barely survive through. And I could see that that would be like a rift between two different cultures inside yeah, of generations. this displaced group. May yeah, maybe a generational mm -hmm. gap. Maybe mm -hmm. it's like the older ones are more used to <laughs> the higher up. So they want to keep that going. But the younger ones are like, I'd rather just do something else that will, you know, fit us in the here and now. Mm -hmm. we, we got a comment from Runebird who said, given the hot, wide open space, gliding could be more energy efficient for them now, um, which, you know, you see in, in deserts, the, the birds there, they stay high up on the, the thermals mm -hmm. and they can swirl around with very low energy output, which gives them wide range. You know, maybe they're a slow patient hunter and they sit up for long periods just watching. Also, given the land they could take to painting their initially thick feathers like bearded vultures do, changing to a highly visible threat rather than an ambush predator would be a striking visage for a counterculture. I think those mm. are very interesting, Ooh. too. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, it was, I hadn't saw the rest of the question, was immediately thinking cool. gliders. I'm like, oh, yeah, bad guy, villain, vulture. Um, like, the villain for this campaign is this vulture like who's it. out praying everyone is a slow <laughs> silent killer you know <laughs> yeah you know one thing that you do find in deserts often and you also in the mountains is you find things to die there's a lot of red clays and cl and grays and yellows and kind of to rune birdies idea they could use that for ritual for um important displays and even like they're like like they said to a highly visible threat so they could even use it as a way like they're sh if they have shields they could start painting with these just fierce bright colors they're not they're not sneaking up on anybody in the middle of the desert generally mm -hmm. and they i don't know if they want to as flyers it's not their advantage their advantage would be get high up and drop things from the air maybe <laughs> you know bombard them with with rocks or spears from a long enough distance or just yeah just drop on them with talons right yeah both the weight See? of the, the the piercing of the talons and the weight of the swoop is it would yeah. be pretty effective like gravity pick do the work up, for you yeah pick them up fly them away and then drop them i've definitely <laughs> had a number of players do that to me in games 26 <laughs> of swelling damage if you get them up high enough yeah See, i i'm also thinking sorry i'm cutting off people uh no jump in <laughs> um i was just thinking that just when you camera. brought up vultures <laughs> i like the idea of what if the people maybe uh after a generation or two started forming a new religion uh or at least some sort of spiritual practice that kind of coincided with the idea of being a scavenger Mm. as maybe like a idea has been passed down that this new land that provided for us in our time of need provides for us when we need it. Hence the scavenging ideology and thought process like a vulture would. Um, and to tie into what you were saying, Scott, about the whole adding it on to like shields and uh, maybe what they find can be uh, made into their new gear, armor, or just ceremonial attire, uh, I think could definitely be kind of like an animism or kind of just environmental nature, almost druidic uh, sense of spiritual practice that they could start getting involved in as a way to appreciate what they've been given in this horrible crisis. Mm. And I think there's also, but there's also, I think, Brandon, a real opportunity there for, for a cultural schism. Because the idea, if, you, if you've only ever been a hunter, the idea of then scavenging or eating carrion could be a very socially, you know, 
some parts of the society could embrace it and others could find it really revolting. Yeah. So it'd be a hard counterculture a, thing. Yeah. True. And, the, and if they are creatures of faith, there's a very, there's would be, I think very easy, very easy tendency to say, well, this is evil influence or, uh, you know, you, you are ignoring the, the dictates of the, the, bird gods or whatever <laughs> like you know it could be it could be an apostasy or a heresy you know uh, you know another thing that could happen is they could change their their diet in a different way where they and we talked earlier we mentioned earlier about the idea of fishing but often in desert on desert rivers there's large animals living in the water because it's the mm -hmm. one place where they can mm -hmm. so maybe they become these these um hunters of the equivalents of crocodiles and hippos and, you know, the things that, the big things that come to the waters where they become like, like the, I've seen on National Geographic, there's lions that hunt elephants mm -hmm. only along this certain area where they're, where they go into the water and it's very little water. And when they come, the lions attack the elephants, which is way beyond normal, you know, normal Lions don't want to go after elephants. It's just way too risky. Mm -hmm. But there they do, and maybe they become these like big game hunters, and they stick to their guns. Like in the mountains, there's goats and things like that. But I don't think you have that middle animal so much as huge and small. So yeah. maybe seasonally they go after the big stuff, and then they they fish with spears rather than nets. I think nets would feel. Nets might feel, you know, displaced from their society too far, but spears yeah. I think are very much like a talon or something maybe tridents or whatever that you get some some reach like that, and that could be very interesting. Like crocodile hunting aracocra, mm. I mean that would be like a a brave <laughs> thing to do, and they, you know, and then that leads to decor because the remnants of of your culture become your decor crocodile teeth and tusks mm. or uh seal skins and you know walrus tusks become you know the things that you you decorate if that's what's there i don't know yeah. and they, I mean, they can also be building materials too like or true um, or clothing mm -hmm. yeah yeah no, and I, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I was just thinking about how good of a question this is that, because the giants wouldn't come down to the desert because it'd be hard as hell for them to walk in the desert <laughs> because they're so oh, big. God. They would yeah. fall in the sand all over the place. They would probably be sitting ducks in the desert. Um, I don't know. Just had that thought. I was like, oh, that's actually a perfect setting, place for them to go to hide from yeah. giants in mm -hmm. the desert. JMK uh, fan added about the scavenging idea that it could also support the mindset of frugality, scarcity, and thankfulness. So, you know, waste not, want not. Like, when you're in a desert, when you get the big the, the big food source, regardless of whether it was alive when you got there or not, mm. maybe it's just too important. Uh, I mean, yeah, in a desert, that every food thing is a big deal. It becomes so important to your culture when we have that scarcity of food. Mm. Yeah, but so also, they're probably having to learn preserving techniques that they didn't need in the mountains. Yeah, maybe um, putting yeah. it putting it in clay and stuff like that to to preserve it for long for longer times and things like that. <clears throat> what about what about trade? What happens with trade? They're they're not used to the slow process of get you know flying is one easy way of moving small goods, mm. Mm. but at these great distances, you know people who do trade could be just amazing people i'm picturing hot air balloons <laughs> mm. <laughs> just because they have the big areas to pick mm. up and set them down oh wow and they you know even if it's um they when i where i grew up they would set off hair, hot air balloons by my house all summer long and it's these like beautiful big field and because they need because you're it's hard to land a hot air balloon accurately so they need like this whole big space to land it and i'm imagining um the only problem with that is it is get pretty windy in more desert areas as well so it'd be harder to navigate but i but i imagine with an ira cocker flying along it they could really guide those winds really well mm. uh, maybe I mean, if yeah <laughs> you know like in in long boats you know, they would have oarsmen 
you can have wings to the outside, people flying yes. to the outside, pulling it by ropes. Yes. You know, to, to maintain, I mean, that's very interesting, the idea of them being turned into the equivalent of, of rowers on a big boat. They become <laughs> the flyers strapped to the side, just making sure it stays going the right place. Yeah. Just like a um, a crate full of like they're shipping like lions to a rich person on the coast, and they fly them up and then fly along with this like live animal goods, you know, or like uh, it would be very fun. So, yeah, Rune Birdie <laughs> added that image could be a great way to introduce them to players as well. They see a crocodile burst out to catch the herbivore, only to have a wind pushed splash of water as the Aracocra take out the croc in front of them. And they spelled Eric Cockrell right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to copy that, Eric, and put it up there. I hate I, that I have it Five bucks says they copied and pasted it from somewhere. <laughs> I think... That's okay. That just means they were smarter than, than us. As a, like, major trade, the... If they do get involved with like nearby settlements, uh, if there's like human settlements in the area or anything, I think that the biggest thing that the Aarakocra would have is the water transport. Since this is a desert region, being able to just fill a water skin, fly, not have to traverse on the land or deal with any land enemies, and being able to deliver this water to nearby settlements would be a huge like emphasis for them because not only would they be uh, in a situation that's amenable and uh, comfortable for both them and who they're trading with, they also get kind of a safety net because you don't fuck with the people or you don't, sorry, uh, you don't uh, mess with the people that uh, are delivering your water. Mm. So you would kind of keep yourself in a situation of you need me kind of thing. Yeah. I th That depends a lot too, like on, because we, we said that the area that they're settling in is uninhabited, but if there are other, are you talking about trade between sort of Aracocra villages or trade with other, are there I other civilization set like settlements that are reachable i would say that easily initially it would probably have to be other settlements along along their 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 living areas mm -hmm. try you know other tribes or what have you but eventually you know if they if they grow technologically they can make boats or they can fly their air their airboat air boats to other places although i think they would avoid the mountains where they lived before <laughs> As the giants <laughs> might know, and throw rocks and stuff at their yeah. uh, their balloons. Danny's yeah. point about the the hot air balloons makes me it gives me a couple of, of thoughts. The first being that that might actually that might be a, a way that they preserve some of their old hunting techniques. Like by you know they go up in the balloon, they use that they they drift for a while, they use that to sight something, and then. They, they leap out of the balloon and fly down rather than having to do the gliding all over the place. They're sort of reconnoitering. Yeah, yeah. The also balloon. the balloon would give them the ability to lift an animal right. and carry it to to their, you know, their civilization, wherever that happens to be, which is, I mean, it's kind of a fascinating Eric Cochran group tribe now. I think there's something right. really exciting about it. But the <laughs> other, the other, it. the other, th the other point that that raises for me though is that I think maybe we've missed a couple of threshold questions in the sense of, like, how technologically advanced are they when they arrive, yeah. or, or maybe how technologically advanced were they when they were in their original habitat, and then how much of that is preserved, like are are they, do they have, do they already have balloons that they can take their stuff out of the mountains? Or is this something that they're, and, and sort of, sort of the corollary to that is like, how long then are we talking about from the initial migration mm -hmm. to, yeah. to be able to establish how much time they've had to explore these alternate, the alternate techniques of hunting, the alternate technologies the, to yeah, figure out where to get wood to build the, the, the you know, the, the, the frame and stuff. Like stealths, you know, um, those are yeah, two those are all big questions for, for how they would go that's <laughs> yeah. true yeah i think when we mentioned trade i was imagining that it's 
they're trading with people they used to trade with when they're in the mountains, you know, like it's not, they're not established. I imagine that they weren't establishing new trades. They were finding, um, you know, they're reconnecting with their trades that they had before they were displaced, um, mm. which is, I think would lend them more, like it would probably help them more with, if they're that point where they're trading with other tribes, I feel like they'd probably be more advanced. Um, and you know, enough that they probably have like, you know, um, carts and things and they've invented the wheel at least you know <laughs> all right so i have i have one more i think that we can get in before you know we get too far down uh, to the to the end of the show so it let's imagine that there's a city set in the in this center spot between the uh, land to the north and south mm. what are the things that affect geographically this i mean it's an interesting place potentially a dangerous place but what does it do to the culture if you're in a place like that you know there's roads going north and south you know there's trade you know people want to mm. go trade north and south but there's also water so there's potential for them going around you so what becomes of that of those people that live there and this is a specific like city so it's not necessarily a whole culture mm-hmm yeah, uh, I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, which is um, which is an isthmus like this. Um, it's a city, a strip of land between two lakes, and so I imagine the culture is a lot of uh, college sports and drinking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, <laughs> cheese know. curds and craft beer. <clears throat> yeah, mm-hmm. um. <laughs> I mean, potentially it could be gymnastics and and uh, white wine. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Still pairs with cheese nicely, though. Yes, cheese <laughs> always. So I think for me, the, the question that, that the immediate question that that raises is, is going back to that sort of government question, like, are we talking about this is a sort of city state and there are yeah, others let's make it a city state. around it's a free there? City. Oh, is, so then I, you know, if the, if the folks in the, in the, in either the North or the South, are bigger and more organized. Maybe there is a constant back and forth of the these these forces are always sort of warring over this over this strip of land, and or if they have developed enough, you know, if they've developed diplomatically, you know, probably just from a land standpoint, like they probably don't have the the like the uh, to be able to keep a standing army to keep both of those areas at bay. But maybe they've developed enough diplomacy and, and a canny or canny with trade and, or the, maybe there's some natural resource there that keeps that they have, they have just enough influence to be able to stay neutral, yeah. you know, and maybe they end up be, being sort of diplomatically like brokering treaties between the, the North and the South. Um, I mean, there's a lot of different potential, potential ways that that could go. I think. I'm, I'm going to show a little bit of my weebishness. Um, <laughs> Because this, uh, to pull out a video game that this kind of reminds me of, um, this kind of reminds me of a, a Fire Emblem game, uh, Three Houses, uh, where Great three game. different, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, three different countries on one continent, and in the middle of it is a monastery, essentially. Uh, that has its own kind of sovereign land. And the monastery acts as kind of like this neutral ground between the three countries. Um, so I would feel like this city-state would end up being this kind of like neutral ground that the North and the South would try to uh, via the, or try and uh, go for like the, how am I trying to phrase this? Trying to appease them as much as possible, trying to kind of get their good graces uh, because they would have the probably more money, more resources, more something that the North and the South would want. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that they would be kind of like the neutral mitigating third party in this uh, one thing, one thing that could be important for them is to have 
especially if they have, if they're geographically, they're in a very defensible position, would potentially be a navy on both sides of the water. Mm. You know, so they, they can limit others trying to go around their trade controls, <laughs> you know, mm. to, to force them to go through the trade routes that they that they establish. That also puts them in a very dangerous position where they must always maintain a more powerful navy. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they could go the other way where they become a really a militaristic um, controlling state. Not not for conquest, but for just keeping a line of separation between the north and south. You know, they, yeah. If they on that, if they really want to uh, like set up a boundary where they're like, you have to go through us to do this, they could make a canal in this section yeah. um, of Earth mm. as well, where they like because I imagine if if that north goes on for a while, the south goes on for a while. If you want to get through this area anyway, I mean, this that could be the I could really skyrocket their whole everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, yeah, they would stop. You'd have to cross the canal to get from north to th- south on land, um, or you'd have to, yeah. But, uh, and they wouldn't bother with, tr- they probably wouldn't screw with them at all either because they're like, well, yes, we love this. This is a very exp- very nice convenience for all of us. <laughs> uh, unless people want to take it, you know, which I guess is the way of the world. But, um, but yeah, that is, yeah. I mean, the, the twins in, in Game of Thrones was like that. It was like a separator that, you know, they made their money by charging you to cross. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. The, the, you, any way that you go with this, though, there's a lot of opportunity. Like, this is a, this is a place where the, uh, the geography also almost gives you the story. Like, however you decide you want to, whether this place is neutral, whether it's changed hands a couple of times, whether it's you know, there are factions that are allied with one nation and factions that are allied with another. Like, th- there's all this opportunity for intrigue in the city itself and then relations yeah. between between the powers. And you could conceive if you wanted to run a really sort of, you know, military strategy campaign, it could be, you know, that one one side or the other has decided it's time to go to war and they're, they're, they're besieging the city or they're, you know, or they're, you know, both armies are meeting on the plains outside the city, and you have to figure out how to how to d- divert them, or you could be trying to avoid that with diplomacy, or trying to set up a trade. Like, there's all kinds of different ways that it, that story could develop depending on the campaign you want to run. It could almost become like the Cold War Berlin, where mm. they have to keep both sides against each other so they don't team up against them because they, mm-hmm. you know, they always have the other side of their of their land they can get trade in if they're under siege from one side right so it becomes important to make sure that both of the north and south they want it, making sure trade is happening but at the mm-hmm. same time making sure they don't become too friendly because then you become you know you're sitting in the middle and you're kind of a sitting duck if they if they grow in arms enough yes if they if they decide to band together and just carve <laughs> you up then you, you cease to exist I was thinking too, if we go like high fantasy with this setting as well, it could be very interesting if maybe if the seas are 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 more dangerous to cross, um, say it's full of monsters mm-hmm. or something, and it is a space like a more safe space to go through. It could go from be it could be this like beautiful like tranquil city, or it could be a completely lawless area because of that. You know, if everybody has to go through here, it'd be very fun. If it was a very like. Like you know, lots of bounty city. hunters, pirates kind of stuff <laughs> could be very fun. Um, a mash of, you know, a whole bunch of different groups of people who all just kind of are stuck here because it's, you know, the only place that will welcome them or if it's a, um, you know, but um, bounty hunters hideout. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, that could be cool too. <laughs> it could even be a, a ruin that is yeah. just terrifying. The monsters are in there keep everyone from crossing except by boat except by by ship mm. yeah, there's, a, there's a lot mm-hmm. of potential for it <clears throat> all right that was that was fun I, i'm gonna make sure that any, every world building has some of that that kind of stuff <laughs> that was a blast yeah i loved it <clears throat> um i have one more question before we before we go to the end because i think it's a fun question and then we'll and then we'll we'll get to the end so one thing we haven't talked a lot about 
is natural resources, and they are part of geography, and it's been mentioned once or twice. Have you used in like what natural resources in your worlds have had the most interesting effects on a culture that you that you've created? Because it can be very interesting. Silver being powerful magically and killing werewolves is a really interesting effect in <clears throat> in uh, European culture, you know, in certain types of games, you mm -hmm. know. So, like, what things, even Electrum is a, is a weird thing in D&D. &D. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I guess I've... anyone ever actually used that Electrum piece as a, as a currency in their games? Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to make sure I wasn't the only one who had just skewed them completely. <laughs> Yeah, I have no idea how much uh, Electrum is worth. I've used it. It's not worth what it says in the book. I used it as currency between mages because it had magical properties. Oh, uh, nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess I, I did use it once as like an ancient type of coin, like uh, from like ancient society coin. Right. <laughs> Sorry, that was that was a total sidetrack. I apologize. It's okay. Uh, I... Go ahead, Dan. I was gonna say I did. I mentioned one earlier where the um, they were mining the husks of the dead gods mm, for um, resources. Um, it's technically a natural resource it totally at this is. point. Um, but yeah, where it's like yeah, the whole. I mean, every husk basically in that space has a some sort of faction on it, and it's you know it's spell jammers, so it's usually not like a government. It's like a band of pirates, you know, or like a um, who are s trying to smuggle and sell this. Um, I was a, I also made it in that world a it's an illegal resource in a lot of uh, like main like big cities and things. Mm. It's a like a contraband kind of thing. The military is supposed to be the only ones who can use because it makes boosters. It's like jet booster jet fuel. So right. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think it's but that's cool. fun. But <laughs> I haven't gone deep into natural resources to be honest. I I did I just finished running uh, the first half of a. The, the out of the abyss module mm -hmm. it takes place in the underdark and there's a, a deep gnome city and one of their uh one of the things that they specialize in is spell gems They're, they have a mine where they can get gems that are that are well attuned to being polished and shaped and then used to store spells and we went a little bit cool. deeper into that than than is written in the module we talked about how that why that made them because they're, they're, they're being resettled after having been sacked by the drow and then abandoned for a long time. The city's being resettled. And so why that why that resource made it attractive, an attractive target for the drow um, why, and how re you know, reopening the mine and establishing their their dominance in that market would, again, sort of be a, an economic engine for the city. We have a, I had a tiefling artificer in our, in our party who really, really wanted to learn how to make spell gems. And so... They were very reluctant to teach her, but after they saved the city from an uh, incursion of oozes, they made they, they said, "All right, we'll teach you how to do this." But they made her sign this very long magical NDA about how she's not allowed to teach anybody else how to do it. She's not allowed <laughs> to sell them in the underdark. She's not allowed to adapt the technology into any other vessels. So it was <laughs> an incursion of oozes. Yes, <laughs> that's <Yeah>. awesome. <laughs> uh, I, can't, I can't take credit for it. That's that's uh, it, that's part of the module itself. It, it, uh, it's Jubilex is is rising out of the oh, abyss yeah. and yeah. influencing. So so I didn't make that part up, but the <laughs> the language of the NDA was all me. <laughs> I I love the idea of a magical NDA that I am putting that in somewhere that has to go somewhere. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've had the lawyers too. I, I'm like, I have a, a a clan of kobolds that have a, a lawyer. <laughs> so when they make a deal, they they it's like this long contract. Best speech I ever wrote for an NPC was the when the when they when the artificer PC was was complaining about the contract. The 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 poor deep gnome who's the only lawyer in this in this town right um it, he, he just goes off on like on this rant about how okay yeah i you know, none of the, none of them none of the rest of the gnomes like me because i'm the one who has to tell them all, all the reasons why their stuff is it whether whether wanting to share their technology is impractical and you're going to complain because i'm keep i'm being restrictive so why don't we just cut to the part where everybody hates me and but there's no way you're going to get this technology out of here without going through me. So you sign the document and then we just, and I was very proud of it. 
in in terms of a natural resource, I can don't really have any like like an ore or a gem or something that like comes out of the earth. Um, again, I guess the most natural resource, uh, cause in like my, uh, because in like Yulfe, magic itself is purely based off of stories. Stories are literally magical. Um, and they're all folklore passed down. So, uh, I guess a natural resource would be the human imagination um so that, somebody needs to make dream catchers that can capture <laughs> these things for the that are only there temporarily but then it maintains it you know for those who can use it that would be a cool resource they might have that going. cyberpunk <laughs> <laughs> i mean yeah. natural resource can be a lot of things furs trees or wood Water can be a, a a super powerful one in some in some games in the right circumstances. You know, ores obviously because because so many nations on the on Earth built their monetary system around ore, but that doesn't mean it has to be. It's been built around shells and flowers and all kinds of crazy things at different points in history. None of which makes any of them necessarily inherently better or worse. Only scarcity made it better. That's it. Mm. Or perceived scarcity, as in, like in diamonds. Diamonds aren't really rare. Their their perception is they're rare, and that gives them value beyond what their actual value is. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's always interesting. But you know, in a in a sci-fi game, it could be air becomes an amazing resource, or the the tools for for making you know something converts that will convert or create air for you. <clears throat> mining equipment if you're in space. I mean, there's all kinds of things yeah. that can be really interesting resources. Not necessarily all natural, but but they become but they become important. All right. I, if you don't have any more on it, I think we've reached the end of the night. We ran a little bit over. I tried to end it right at 1030-ish, but it was just too good a conversation to end <laughs> early. It would have been too painful to end it earlier. So why don't we go around... <laughs> backwards this time and let we'll start with danny and we'll go you know counterclockwise so you can say where you can be found and who you are and all that <laughs> great yes i am danny hello goodbye um you can find <laughs> me on the internet as uh, at danny at 20 um you can also find me at start playing dot games as just danny i i i got in early enough that i got to be just danny um and uh, hopefully someday soon we'll start Twitch streaming again at Only Dan's D and D, the only uh, D and D stream made by Dan's for <laughs> for Dan's and everyone else. Um, are all the players Dan's also? Yes, all the players are Dan's of some kind, um, and all of our characters have Dan in their names. And um, we have uh, we're on a quest with the dangerous blade um, that's <laughs> guiding us places. It's we've been on hiatus for a while, but. Uh, Hopefully it'll start coming back soon. I am a sucker for a pun and a magic item. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. yes. Well, right, I am K.O. Myers. I'm on Twitter at Troublematic. My podcast production company is Particulate Media. Um, the rebooted podcast that I'm hoping to relaunch in the summer is going to be called Adventure Capital. Uh, we have a landing page up at adventurecapitalpod.com that gives you will give you information if you're interested in coming on the show to brainstorm TTRPG assets uh, and as well as um, uh, crowdfunding opportunity. So uh, that's me. And Scott, thanks very much for having us. Uh, it's been a blast. This is our first world building one. I'm super excited about doing more of them now. <laughs> and B. Hi, I'm Big B, Brandon. You can find me on Twitter at uh, Big B is dot, dot, dot. Not actually dot, 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 but the word dot, dot, dot. Um, you can find me on DriveThruRPG, uh, publisher name Big B. Uh, you can find Yulfe on there. Uh, Dreamweaver's Debate, new adventure came out. It's absolutely free. 
uh, pick it up, uh, check it out, and hopefully, oh, and Tuesday night you can see on me, you can see me on Heroes and Hooligans. Oh, I love Heroes and Hooligans. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> <clears throat> and some voice acting work for them. <laughs> and I there are so many shows. There are <laughs> so, so many shows. <laughs> I am Scott. I'm one half of Zealzaddy, and next week's show is going to be on indie sci-fi settings and systems, so mm -hmm. uh, join us for that one. It's going to be very... If you love sci-fi, if you're not sure about sci-fi, a lot of questions will be answered about it, so you can learn some, some cool ones to try out, um, one of which I've backed, one of which uh, came out after I knew about them, or before I knew about them, so I didn't get to back it. And then just talking about cool systems. And I don't mean the biggest ones like Traveler or whatever, but smaller ones too. There's a lot of very cool small sci-fi settings that are a lot of fun. So we'll see you next week. Um, have a good night, everybody. And uh, we oh, join us for Elixir. That's Tuesday night. Good night. Bye. Good night, everybody. <laughs> good night. Bye. Thanks. All right. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>